So I, I um, hope that you all were able to um, understand the different language interpretation and that you're in your preferred channel. So of those of us who are in the Spanish channel, you should be hearing Spanish now um, with the interpretation of Silvia. And those of us in English, uh, we will start by um, starting, excuse me. Um, so if you're comfortable to introduce yourself in the chat, please um, add your name. Um, you can introduce yourself by sharing your pronouns and how you feel about the snow, the snow that was happening recently. Um, you know, they were saying it was a lot of coverage and um, luckily we, we didn't get hard. So at um, any point in during the lecture, any point in the class, you can add your questions into the chat directly and Katie or one of us will keep track of it. Um, and you may get like a direct response or some instruction on um, when, your, when your question will be asked. We will also have a Q&A at the end. Um, so just to mention that be 20 minutes at the last part, but we'll get a short break before that. As um, part of this class, we think it's important to acknowledge uh, the space and the language acknowledgement and also uh, where we are currently. So I'm going to be reading um, the land acknowledgement. The Epidemics of Injustice Planning and Instruction Team acknowledges that the University of Illinois Chicago resides on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Obiwe, Adwa, Bodimuami, purchased after two and a half years of open war warfare, decades of violence, encroachment, and the defeat of pan-Indian movement to keep settlers out of the Great Lakes region at the Treaty of Chicago in 1921, receiving their final payment before moving westward in 1835. The area was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes. The state of Illinois is currently home to more than 75,000 tribal members, and the Chicagoland area is currently home to one of the largest and most diverse urban native communities in the U.S. Illinois is also one of the is also the territory of the Ho Chunk, Miami, Inoka, Menominee, Sac, Fox, and their descendants. By making a land acknowledgement, we recognize that indigenous peoples are, tr are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy, living here long before Chicago was a city and still thriving here today. As we work, live, play, and on these territories, we must ask what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonization and state violence and support indigenous community struggle for self-determination and sovereignty. So I want to introduce the course instruction team who worked um, with countless others to um, bring together this present uh, the presentation of different speakers and what we'll be learning about throughout the semester. Um, and so I'm the course instructor. We have Katie O'Connell, the course TA, the teaching assistant. Emily at Zork, sorry, it's a porn at yeah. the administrative. Yeah. Uh, Um, the administrative staff, Tiffany Ford, the instruction, the instructor on record, and Sylvia Escarcega, interpreter and translator. And so about this course, Epidemics of Injustice was developed through a collaborative between the members of the Radical Public Health RPH, the UIC School of Public Health SPH, graduate students and faculty who were brought together in 2017 by the sense of urgency to address ongoing threats to democracy, uh, social justice and public health. Uh, reactionary politics and policies and resulting unjust circumstances have a long history and are resurgent today. And you'll learn um, more about this group uh, throughout the class. Uh, Katie? Thank you for that introduction. Um, just to give a little course history, as mentioned, E of I began in 2017. Um, so we're in the course's eighth year. Uh, each year, the planning committee decides on a theme to center us throughout the semester. Um, past themes are, are shown on this slide. Last year, our most recent year was co-disruption for collective liberation in public health. 
And that brings us to this year, um, where our theme is Health Equity Praxis, Building Possible Worlds Together. Uh, this was decided on by members of RPH, um, Radical Public Health, this past summer. Um, many of us read the book, Let This Radicalize You, by Kelly Hayes and Miriam Kaba for a book club. The class theme and many of the topics inspired um, by what we learned through this book and our conversations about it. So we're asking throughout the course, um, what is the possible world we want to see built? The format of this course is going to be two weeks to a given topic with one week consisting of a lecture and the following week consisting of an action lab. Um, this week, for example, today we're having Dr. Murray lecture. Next week will be an action lab facilitate facilitated by Radical Public Health. Um, the pairings will consist of seven course modules that will bring us to the end of the semester. And then lastly, we want to highlight the class website. This site is updated frequently and will be where to visit for the class schedule, resources, lecture slides, class recordings, and other information. Yeah, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much. And so today I have the great pleasure of presenting Dr. Lederay Murray. Um, I've had the pleasure to learn from her um, over many years and I'm very grateful that she is um, speaking with us today on an introduction to health equity. So Dr. Murray plays a leadership role in many organizations, including the National Association of City and County Health Officers, Health Equity and Social Justice Team, the National Executive Board of American Public Health Association, and serves on the board of the Chicago-based Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. In 2011, Dr. Murray served as president of the American Public Health Association. She is the co-chair of the Urban Health Program, Community Advisory Committee at UIC. Dr. Murray has been a voice for social justice and healthcare as a basic human right for over 40 years. She remains passionate about increasing the number of Black and Latino health professionals. And with that, we welcome Dr. Murray um, to speak with us today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Let me get my slides up here. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Let me first point out that I have, uh, I'm sick, so hopefully my voice will hold out through this lecture. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to uh, be the kickoff lecturer for this series. The fact that this is a student-generated course, I think it's its, it's underlying strength. Um, and I just like to be clear that what I'd like to do today is help set the tone for <clears throat> certainly what else happens in, in this semester but also to challenge all of us to think differently uh, than we usually do about public health and to have different kinds of discussions than we often have. So <clears throat> I don't have a specific topic per se. I will be mentioning lots of possible books. I don't even know if you still require a book report in the course, but if you do, that's a good thing. But um and I unfortunately will be going faster than is reasonable uh, because I really just want to lay out a series of questions for us. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Malcolm X, of course. Uh, Thinking can be dangerous. And so let me just say in the very beginning that you don't often become popular by thinking. So just keep that in mind. I don't have to spend time on the land acknowledgement since it was done in the introduction, except to say this that it's not simply enough that we do land acknowledgement as a ritual, though it's not a bad ritual. Uh, uh, this is just a, a look at our basic interstate highway system, which is built on top of indigenous uh, traffic ways. Um, but that it's important, and you don't have to memorize this, but it's important that you have some sense of how to look up and keep in the back of your mind exactly the structural nature of how, in fact, uh, the indigenous land was stolen, um, among many other things. And so it's not just those one or two treaties that we mentioned in the introduction. There's a whole series of treaties, and we violated all of these treaties 
the U.S. government violated all these treaties. But they have real meaning uh, today. <clears throat> and um, in our city, when I first came to Chicago in the 60s, in the late 60s, Uptown, as it says here in the bottom, was called Hillbilly Heaven and Redskin Road because that's where a large number of uh, Native Americans live. Because of the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, that's an act where the, the U.S. government made a conscious public decision. They said, we first need to get Native Americans off of the lands, the few lands that they had left uh, reservations. And secondly, we want them to disappear completely. Um, and so they had a program called the Indian Relocation Act. And that's a program where they <clears throat> went in with financial incentives and coercion, like not having running water in your house, for example, and uh, tried to convince Native Americans to leave reservation lands, where at least they have some sovereign power, and to relocate to other places. And so Chicago was one of the major areas for relocation. That That is why we have such a diverse uh, population of Native Americans in our city, because they were relocated from all over the country. So that's why our numbers are so high and why they're extraordinarily diverse. We don't have, unlike, say, um, other neighboring states, we actually don't have any reservations or Native uh, nations within the borders of Illinois. But uh, the city of, Bill of Chicago has a huge number of Native Americans. Um, and you can see here from 2018, uh, we have 175 different tribes represented in our city, and our American Indian Center is the oldest urban Indian center in the country. And we also have, for those of you, especially those of you that are doing clinical work, we also have one of the Bureau of Indian uh, Health Service clinics located, an urban clinic located in our city. So I wanted to start with this basic chart, which I hope is not unfamiliar to most of you. This is just looking at life expectancy for a number of different rich nations, including the United States, from 1700s to, to recently. And you may have seen the news uh, articles that talk about life expectancy going up and down and what that means. But let me <clears throat> suggest this to you. This crude measure that we use sort of to of a, uh, do we really in our you know this life expectancy as opposed to the cohort life expectancy uh, the cohort life expectancy just to remind those of you that have taken your epi that's actually looking at it is right now for you all that are alive because you all don't have to all be dead where we could calculate that so so we frequently use the peer we most frequently use the period life expectancy which is an estimate for an imaginary cohort. Um, and you can see here in the United States, this little, um, uh, it's hard to tell where this line is going to, this little line here, purple line, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, right here. Anyway, this line is not the top. We don't do very well with life expectancy. And if you compare us to peer countries, other rich countries, we do horrible. So one of the questions is why? And how we answer that question as a field, as a public health field, says a lot about our values. It says a lot about the theories that we use to think about what makes people healthy and what makes people sick. And if we don't consciously discuss that, and if we're not aware of the arguments that we have in public health about why life expectancy is like this, uh, then we're really uh, doing a disservice to our field. Before cell phones, this happens to be the Chicago uh, race riot of uh, 1919. This is a very famous picture, especially the ones on the bottom. I bet you've seen somewhere before. But this is an actual <coughs> picture. This is before Laquan McDonald and uh, video cameras are police. This is an actual picture of a, a number of white citizens of our city literally beating to death this black man uh, in 1919. This is the uh, riot that occurred after a young black adolescent swam past the imaginary invisible line on the lake and kicked off this riot. 
Um, and so they the there was a commission here that inter, that in fact let me go back so I right down here you can you'll get these uh, slides in a PDF. Here is the source of all these pictures and report. So in 1922, the Chicago Commission on Race Relations issued a report to Negro in Chicago, a study of race relations and a race riot. We should not be doing a community health assessment in this city without reading that report. I, I don't know how it becomes possible to do that. Uh, so I invite you, I'm going to spend a little time on that report to look at that report and think about what, what it is talking about in the early 20s. Um, and so this just it looks at the riots in Springfield because there were riots in this period over the whole country. That's another question. How is it that in the early 1919, 1920, 1921, 1922, you had riots? What do I mean by that? You had white citizens rioting all over the nation, going into black neighborhoods and killing people. Why did that happen all in that time? What else was going on internationally in that time? World War I, among other things. Um, and so it looked at the riots in Springfield. It looked at the demographics of the city, employment. It looked at the criminal justice system. It looked at community assets. It basically is a community health assessment for the city of Chicago in 1922. Um, and so looking at that makes, uh, makes an important, uh, I think, statement. And here are two more recent books that obviously are not talking about 1919, but do talk about the structural character of our city. The Chicago on the Make came out a couple of years ago as did this multiracial promise. So again, when you have some understanding of what's going on, where are people working, where are people living, what is in fact making people healthy or sick, then you have some hope of understanding what's, uh, what's really going on in the city. And so here are some areas that this particular report, the Negro in Chicago, talks about. It talks about a psychological notion about why criminals are criminals. And again, if you go back and read this report, you'll see themes that we talk about today. So this notion that somehow some people are just have a warped sense of morals, some people are just amoral. So this particular report talks about it. It was, a, by the way, a report that was multinational in character. It wasn't all written by white people. So, uh, <clears throat> so they're saying that, uh, a desire for social revenge is something you could expect from Negroes, uh, considering how we were treated by the by the police. They talk about an atmosphere, an environment where crime is encouraged and tolerated. Um, and interestingly, this is my favorite part of this report, they correctly point out that the major areas that we have to worry about this in Chicago is among white athletic clubs, in other words, white gangs, such as the original Mayor Daley belonged to when he was a young man. Um, and so they correctly point out that this is a real problem in terms of this riot, and this is reason that the riot took place. Um, and so again, just looking, they have a bunch of recommendations. I didn't put them all in here. They recommend that, um, that they enforce the law in black neighborhoods and Negro neighborhoods, vice resorts, other things. They recommend that there's a better cooperation between the city and the park police, because at that point in time, there was a, a park police for the city parks. Um, and they recommend that <coughs> the Chicago police control the white clubs. That's, that's what this euphemism is, athletic clubs on the south side. The Bridgeport, these are the white <coughs> clubs, uh, Italian and uh, Irish predominantly on the uh, on the south side of the city. I also just want to remind you and point out that we have on campus an important series of reports by ethnicity from IRRPP. So you should look those up and be aware that they exist because they give you some hyper local information and data. So let me summarize, uh, just to be clear, this comes from Kamara Jones, Dr. Jones, but I don't disagree with these points. We have to be clear, what are the values as Americans that we hold dear. Uh, and I think these are our values and they get us in a lot of trouble. We narrowly focus on the individual, not just in public health, though it's inexcusable that we do that in public health, um, but as a society, we act as though if you get ahead, it's because you individually did something or you individually failed to do something. Um, we have an ahistorical approach to the world as Americans. Uh, in many parts of the world, when people 
when you talk to other people about their country or their nation, they have some better sense of history of the nation. But we as Americans, we tend to only go back six months, eight months, a year. Um, and that colors, in fact, how we think about problems and solutions. We support, as Americans, a white supremacist ideology. You, this is a base American value. Uh, it doesn't matter what we tell our third graders, what in fact are American values. So if you, if you say this is a country that supports a white supremacist ideology, lots of other things suddenly become clear. We support and propagate this myth of American exceptionalism, which I find an amazing thing to do. How a grown person, I have trouble thinking about how, how a child could do this, but how a grown person could act like the United States of America is an exceptional country and we get to do exceptional things and we're the best thing since time. I mean, it's, just, it's amazing to me. And on the basis of no facts, uh, we have a myth of meritocracy, this notion that you get what you've earned in our country. Uh, absolutely, when you look at the evidence, there is no evidence of this. Um, we have the myth of a zero-sum game. So the notion is if someone else gets a place to sleep, Somehow my bed is in danger. If someone else gets health insurance, medical insurance, somehow my medical insurance is in danger. That's what a zero sum game means. And we have a limited future orientation that sort of matches an ahistorical stance. So we have trouble thinking about what, what's gonna happen in two years or five years or 10 years or 50 years. These in fact, I think, these are not the only American values. But these are the American values, I think, that hold us back and present amongst the greatest threats to us as a people. And then I want to ask us and challenge us as public health people to be very careful when we throw around the words, we're a science-based field. I, I don't think that's particularly true. I, I have no problem as an aspirational uh, effort for public health, but to suggest that somehow public health is more science-based than other areas is absurd. And in general, our notion about science is pretty truncated. So if we think about <clears throat> our definitions of science, here are three possible definitions. <laughs> They're not mutually exclusive. But, and I, and I, I think there's a level of truth to all of them, but I think it's important that we keep an eye on this third definition. Science is a social institution just like other social institutions. And it interacts in that context. So it's not simply a body of knowledge or a specific set of methods. Those are useful, but it's also really a social institution. Um, the other thing about science, and it, because in public health, we tend, especially after COVID, we tend to confuse that with religion. When you think about it, technically speaking, science is always wrong because science is always adding new information and new knowledge. So whatever we think is scientifically true today, if we're doing good science, it won't be true tomorrow. Um, and, and so again, remembering that and having some humility about how we address those things, I think becomes critical for people in public health. Um, and so our goal again is not only to understand what's going on, to be able to predict what's going on. So in theory, we can make better decisions as human beings to uh, end up in better shape uh, with healthier people and healthier populations. Obviously, we're not doing very good there. But to think about science and what it means, it helps to have some understanding of history. I'm trying to slow down for our interpreters. Here's a, here's a good slide for me to slow down. So, here are so he one thing is simple. You can tell that I think history is important. We don't have that many history books in our field. We have some, not a whole lot not like other fields, but in any case, here are three basic uh, general histories of American public, mostly American public health. George Rosen's book um, is, uh, is there. It's one of the classics. Um, the Sanitarians by Duffy is also a good basic book. Dorothy Porter's book concentrates more on the United Kingdom, but nonetheless, uh, I think it has enough relevance for us. Um, I, I will say this just as a comment. Uh, when I was getting my MPH, there was a requirement that you take a history course. We only had one course in the history of public health. But again, I'm not clear how you can get a graduate degree in public health with no understanding of the history of public health. Mm -hmm. And then you have a global pandemic and you wonder why people don't want to get vaccinated. So 
And even what we mean by health is up for debate. We don't agree on this. We don't agree on this as a society. We don't agree on this as a field. That's okay. But if you don't know what arguments people are having, then you're really in trouble. Okay. You at least ought to begin to learn what are we arguing about in public health? What do we disagree about? So then you can figure out what your position is. Um, so, you know, whether we start off with this basic sort of Webster dictionary, uh, freedom of disease and pain, uh, this is the WHO, the second bullet is a WHO definition written in 1948 when the WHO was established. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, not merely an absence of disease or infirmity. Now, I will tell you, when I was a medical student in the early 70s at, at our College of Medicine, the Abraham Lincoln College of Medicine, they changed the name. I really was upset about that. But anyway, um, they told us that this definition, the WHO definition, did not apply to the United States. When we were too rich. We were above this definition. Interesting notion. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. And this last sentence, and I again, I invite you to Google this and look it up. This is from the People's Health Agenda. Um, and this is my personal, I prefer this definition. Health is a social, economic, and political issue, and above all, a fundamental right. Inequality, poverty, exploitation, and violence, and injustice are at the root of ill health and the deaths of poor and marginalized people. Health for all means that powerful interests have to be challenged, that globalization has to be opposed, and that political and economic priorities have to be drastically changed. So think about those different definitions of health. And so how then do you talk about epidemics of injustice? If you think it's mostly number one, just mental and physical well-being, you could argue that black people were the healthiest under slavery. Um, we didn't live that long and uh, you couldn't really work if you weren't strong and health, relatively healthy. Um, so are we better off there in 1700 or are we better off today where we have all kinds of chronic diseases, et cetera? So you have to really ask, what do we really mean by health? How are we going to measure health? How do we know if a population, one population is healthier than another population? Here's some more excellent books. Again, these are books not just for people in epi, though if you are uh, doing epi and biostats, you should certainly have these people, these books. Nancy Krieger, I think, is our one of our finest living epidemiologists. Uh, she's at Harvard at the moment. Uh, the first book, Epidemiology and the People's Health, is really a historical overview of epidemiology and the fights and arguments that we have in epidemiology. We'll talk a little bit more about some of those later. This second book is uh, her most recent book, and it just summarizes. She's a huge body of work. It summarizes her body of work and the development of her eco-social theories. And here's just a, a diagram of her eco-social theory. I, I'm not going to spend time on this. There's a whole courses on this. But this is only one theory. So, again, it's, here's the issue. I'm not, I don't know. I don't. I think the core courses, someone could correct me in the question and answers later. I don't think the core courses concentrate on this. I think they still use the WHO sort of diagrams, which is, you know, that's better than what we, they used to use. Um, but Nancy's theory is just one. So what are the other theories? What are the differences between this theory and other theories that are out there? Which ones do we use? When you read an article, do you know what the underlying theory around population health exists in the authors that are writing that article. And if you don't know or can't figure it out, do you really understand the article? This is a great series of books, but this is up here, not you should read any book, but it, I wanna point out this Jaime Braille's book here, The Critical Epidemiology and the People's Health. Uh, Dr. Braille is really one of the senior people, <clears throat> leading uh, epidemiologists in the world. He is an excellent representation for the Latin American epidemiology grouping. These, in my personal opinion, are the most progressive epidemiologists on the planet. Uh, they don't, they do not completely agree with uh, Dr. Krieger's theory. So here's another set 
of progressive notions about what is involved in a progressive epidemiology. How do you define issues? And there are differences. Again, I think the basic thing we should be asking is that we understand, or at least first be aware of what those differences are. Um, and since this uh, epidemics of injustice is focusing on the United States, I just wanted to mention a couple of other, I'm gonna be mentioning books throughout here, but here's some other basic books that, that uh, I think uh, people should really seriously read or reread. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Again, I think one of the finest minds uh, in social sciences ever, but certainly in the past century, uh, his really best uh, known book, uh, Black Reconstruction, he really discusses in detail racial capitalism. He doesn't use that framing. He, he doesn't use that jargon. But uh, if you really want to understand racial capitalism, you have to at least start here with Du Bois's book. And he explains to you, in fact, what happened in the United States. Um, Nell Painter, uh, again, a, a retired historian now, uh, has an excellent book on the history of white people. And it always, it's always interested me. If you're interested in racism and you're interested in what's going on in the United States or what, what happens with this racist white supremacy, but it's rare that we actually study white people. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a clinician. I mean, it's sort of like, those are the people that are sick, the white people. So why shouldn't we study anyway? This is a great book, The History of White People. I, I encourage you to uh, look look at that book and, and uh, check it out. Uh, and last but not least, it's a shorter book, not nearly as difficult to read as Du Bois, um, is uh, Slavery by Another Name. And he really talks about what are the mechanisms that were used at the end of the Civil War to reinstitute for all practical purposes slavery in the United States and around the world. Um, and this is part of a, a debate that's going on today when we talk about how do we address decolonizing the world? Um, I wanna just, again, do a shout out to Kamara with her definition of racism. And I wanna say it in this way, Kamara is a good friend, uh, but this is a simple definition of racism. It is not the most nuanced, but you know we're public health people and we're not good in this area. You know, we've declared racism a public health problem, but race and racism has been studied in sociology and history and anthropology for hundreds of years. And, and the people that are least able to talk about it intelligently are those of us in public health. But this is Kamara's definition, which I think helps us a lot. Um, and, and she argues that it's a hierarchical system that unfairly disadvantages some people. That's the part we didn't study. It unfairly advantages some people meaning white people, but, and again, we tend not to study that, and it saps the strength of the whole society. Um, and Kamara does emphasize, and certainly I agree with this, that anti-Black racism plays a special role in the history of the world. Uh, but certainly in, in the world and in the United States, racism has not and never has been binary. It hasn't been simply Black and white. Uh, so structural racism is something that we we don't have an agreed upon definition for. This isn't a class on this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it is not the same as adding up a bunch of little individual races, okay? Or accumulating microaggressions. In fact, again, to give you some sense of history, I didn't even know what a microaggression was until a few years ago when these younger scholars tried to use it. I mean, to me, it's racism. I don't even know what a microaggression, but anyway, structural racism has to go deep into what makes a society function. Um, and so being able to talk about that, we have a little bit in, in the public health literature that uh, that's coming out. This is a term that has gotten, how can I say this, popular again. Again, when I was young and in college, we talked about racial capitalism a lot for reasons I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but uh, And then it went out of favor for a long time, and now it's resurging. But this is a quote from, I think, uh, from Du Bois that I think makes the clearest statement of what we mean by racial capitalism. Black capital became the foundation stone, not only of Southern social structure, but of Northern manufacture and commerce, of the English factory system, of European commerce, of buying and selling on a worldwide scale. New cities were built on the results of Black labor 
and a new labor problem involving all white labor arose in both Europe and America. So what the boys is arguing, and here I, I would argue he means black labor, not so narrowly as just at labor from Africa. He means non-white labor from not only Africa, but from the Americas, from the East, from China and, and the Southeast Asia, um, and that it's the foundational structure of capitalism. <clears throat> this is an aside, but for those of you, again, that are uh, clinic involved in clinical study, I think American medicine, especially, not by itself, ha has played a special role in uh, foundations of uh, the ideology of racism. We'll give an example in a minute. This is what I was reading when I was, uh, you know, younger. Um, the the uh, Cedric Robinson is the key proponent of uh, racial capitalism, uh, and he wrote about it significantly. Um, and so, again, if you're if you are interested in that, if you're interested in social science or understanding power, I think that's a useful thing. This book uh, on the right here it just came out last year. Um, and I had that picture. So again, I want to be clear. You you know, it's not like you go and you study this and then you learn everything and it's all over. This book, uh, What is Anti-Racism and Why It Means Anti-Capitalism, this is a book that describes the historical development of Black radical thought. That's really what this book does. I put this brother up here because first of all, I thought he looked nice, Anton DeCombe, and, and secondly, I never heard of him. He is, he actually... Uh, fought against colonialism, I'm not even going to say the right, in a small Caribbean Dutch island. Uh, and he didn't write in English, he wrote in Dutch. One of the reasons probably why I never heard of him. But he was causing trouble down there in the Caribbean. And so they came and arrested him because he was anti-colonial. He's trying to get rid of Dutch as the mother country. So they put him in jail in the Netherlands. And when World War II broke out, he was turned over to the Nazis. <coughs> And he actually died in one of the concentration. He died in the Holocaust. He died in one of the concentration camps. So what I'm saying is that because the structure and power of our world is structured the way it is, it's really possible to go and work in a field forever and be unaware of critical uh, pioneers and critical uh, people that you ought to know about. So I should know about this guy, but I just read about him just recently. Uh, I do know about some of the English speaking leaders in this area, Claudia Jones and other people, because we've had more of a relationship, Black Americans, U.S. Americans, and, and Blacks in the Caribbean that speak English, we have more of a relationship since we have a common language. But many, many of uh, my cousins and brothers and sisters that speak uh, Portuguese and Spanish, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, and, and the few that speak Dutch. So again, this is an important thing. I, I, I didn't Put this slide in, but ask yourself, and I won't, I won't waste time and uh, too much time on it. Where do most African Americans live today? Now I've asked this question for years. I ask many student classes that I'm teaching, but I've asked this question in conferences, in conferences with nurses or physicians. I've asked this question in conferences of black social science academics. I've asked this question in conferences of black historians and 99.9% .9 of the time, it's always wrong. And it's not wrong because people are stupid. It's wrong because of how we think about these issues. And in, believe me, in many of these rooms, these people knew better. So most African-Americans do not live in the United States. Most Africans, who were captured and brought across the Atlantic Ocean as part of the slave trade, 95% of them went outside the British colonies. Only between four or 5% ended up in the British colonies that developed into the United States. Think about that for a minute. So when you go around today and you look at our quote unquote recent migrants, <laughs> And that poor young man, the five-year-old that was uh, that died in the shelter, that, that boy looks like he could be my grandson. Because 95% of African slaves ended up 
in Mexico, in the Caribbean, in Venezuela, in Colombia, the vast majority, the majority ended up in Brazil. Okay. But we don't think of them as people who live in the Americas, which of course is not the United States. The Americas is North, Central, and South America, right? People who live in the Americas who have an African history, even a slave African history. So right away, we're in trouble. When we start talking about what makes people health, we, don't, we can't even count. We don't even know what the life expectancy is for anybody because we don't even know how to categorize people. So anyway, I wanted to put my brother up here just to acknowledge. So it's not, don't be upset that you find out new stuff that you didn't know before. Here's some other basics. These are simple, basic books. These are not, I'm not suggesting they are completely mind-blowing. I'm just saying these give you a quick summary if you don't have time to become a historian. So <clears throat> Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book, Summary of Indigenous People's History, she again, <coughs> she tells you what the arguments are in the field. There are a number of excellent books that have come out in the past two or three years that reframe uh, American history from the Native American point of view. You can, if you want to know about that, you can ask me later. But the, that's a nice, great short book, a quick read. And the other one by Paul Ortiz, he he links together African-American and Latinx history, uh, which again is something we completely ignore and act like they exist in different planets. So let's for a moment look at sort of our approach as quote unquote scientists um, in terms of how we address a problem. This is a current problem in public health and we don't have an answer for it, to be honest with you. Uh, some of you, if you had my classes and stuff before, you may have seen this example before, but it's a great example. First, let me do a shout out to Joshua Clark Knott. You can see when he lived, he's a great uh, American physician and gynecologist. I wanna be clear because he's often uh, tagged as a racist, which he was, but you know, if you, if you rid it America of all the racists, wouldn't be a lot of people left. But he, so he's a physician and gynecologist. He did important and major research on yellow fever and malaria. He started the first medical school in Alabama and he was the medical director. He's like the chief uh, general of the Confederate uh, Army in Mobile. So this is a famous doctor who did important work in spite of his being a racist, right? Uh, but I don't wanna, <clears throat> so, Here's one of his famous quotes. The Negro race is standing at the lowest point in the scale of human beings. It is clear they are incapable of self-government and that any attempt to improve their condition is warring against an immutable force of nature. He's one of the people, I can't remember when he died, but he's one of the people who, there were some people at the end of the Civil War, they thought blacks were just going to die out. They thought we were so subhuman. I don't know how they thought we lived for thousands of years in Africa. I'll leave that alone. But they thought we were so subhuman that when we were emancipated from slavery, we would just die. Because without white people to tell us what to do, we would be dead. That's what, He's one of those people that fell in that category. So, And he really did believe in, in important differences. Now, he did not do this work. I don't want to confuse you. He's just an example of, of a kind of Southern physician. In fact, they had specialists in, in Negroology, okay? They had specialist doctors, especially in the Southern part of the United States, in the Caribbean and in South America uh, that talked about the health of slaves and how you keep slaves healthy enough to bring in profits. <clears throat> this is from... Uh, uh, 1849, I'm trying to move my little screen around because different things are hiding it. Uh, and this this journal, you can look this up today. This, you know, the peer review, the Southern Medical Journal, this was a prestigious journal of its day. Now, the concept of peer review didn't exist in 1849, but this is, a uh, uh, like I said, uh, an important and prestigious medical journal. Um, and so, and they didn't do graphs like this in 1849. I just did this so we could so we could have a better way of thinking about it. 
because we do rants like this now. So this is done in a narrative form, but you can go and look this article up in this journal today, uh, The Wonders of Google, and read what it says. And they're basically, for, the, for Hancock County, they're basically describing different diseases. So you have diseases peculiar to women, mostly around reproductive issues, and then specifically miscarriages. Um, and as is typical for American health, public health, we divided people. <clears throat> they didn't care about the Native Americans, so they didn't get they didn't track that. But they did care about slaves because slaves were money. Uh, so they tracked diseases peculiar to women in white women and slaves. And as you can see, both for reproductive problems in general and miscarriages, the women who were enslaved had much higher prevalence of these problems than white women. So what's the problem with this kind of notion? The problem is the thinking of the time, the best medical thinking of the time, whether you oppose slavery or not, was that slaves were supposed to be strong and able to work in conditions that whites couldn't work in. That's why it was not immoral to have slavery. Black women like me were produced, made by God in order to work in the fields. And so how could that be if, if slavery was moral and everything? How could it be that women who were enslaved had more diseases for miscarriages and for other reproductive problems? So that created a quandary, a problem that needed to be explored scientifically. And our guys here. So here's the question. This question exists today. It still exists today. So don't laugh at this article from 1849. Because we have this debate and discussion every day. It may not be stated as crudely, but it's always there. Why do we have this early inequality? Was it the conditions of slavery or the constitutional conditions of the slave? Is there something in the environment and the systems of oppression that made these enslaved women have a poorer health outcome? Or is there something in the nature of the slave that caused a poor outcome. Why are reading scores in Chicago public schools less for brown and black children compared to white children? Is there something in the nature of how we organize the Chicago public school system? Or is there some other strange condition of black and brown children? It might be their parents, you know, we, you know, we're very clever now. We don't just say they're inferior. Maybe, maybe it's their parents that don't have discipline to keep them reading. Maybe they can't think of their future. You know, you have a lot, but it's the same question. It's the same question. So here's a quote directly from um, this article. This table. Don't forget what I said. They, they, they were. They didn't present a slide uh, with chart bar charts. They just say, of disease data, either teaches that slave labor is inimical to the procreation of the species. So, so here's a hypothesis. This shows that either slave labor hurts the health of these women from exposure, violent exercise, etc. So that is a, not an unreasonable hypothesis, especially if you consider the normal thinking of European physicians about pregnancy uh, and, and reproductive issues at that time period. So this would not be an odd thing to think that maybe if you were pregnant, you shouldn't be out in the fields 12 hours a day in the hot sun, uh, you know, doing work. Or here's another alternative hypothesis. As the planters believe, in other words, the people that own the enslaved women, that blacks are possessed of a secret by which they destroy the fetus at an early stage of gestation. So here are two possibilities, two scientific possibilities. The conditions of work of slaves is so bad that it harms the ability of the species to procreate, or these African women are so weird that they have a secret that we could just destroy the fetus. Think about think about this. This has been 
certainly in the past couple of years, women are able to prevent by thinking pregnancy from rape. We've had elected officials talk about that nonsense today. These issues and problems that existed in 1849 still exist today with very little change. So we're still in this article and philosophizing upon the immense difference. We are led to the conclusion. Now, so here we get into our little scientific jargon. Imagine you're writing this article in 1849. We're led to the conclusion from the facts within our knowledge that it originates from the unnatural tendency of the African female to destroy her offspring. Now, this last phrase here, I think, says so much. First, they are clear that this is an unnatural tendency. It's not like, oh, African women have some secret way to control their reproductive. We should, we maybe should try to find that out. No, no, no. They're clear. This is an unnatural tendency <laughs> to destroy the offspring. What does the offspring of a slave mean? What does it mean in 1849 before the Civil War? It means money. That's what it means. It means capital money. So when we see a problem like reproductive hazards, and this is the kind of stuff that uh, makes my blood pressure go up. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, again, when I when I went to college, when I started college, Roe v. Wade, Roe didn't exist. Okay, women didn't have a right to get an abortion in this country when I started college. Um, so it's not until the early 70s that Roe is, is, uh, is passed, is, is uh, decided by the Supreme Court. But among young women of color, we were concerned about reproductive rights. Um, and we were concerned about the forced sterilization of Puerto Rican women, forced sterilization of Mexican-American women, for sterilization of black women. Yeah, we were concerned about reproductive rights, but Roe v. Wade doesn't capture that. So I get upset when people talk about, this is the first time we've had a right taken from us. I'm saying like, what, what country do you live in? I can think of lots of times when we've gone backwards. So this is looking at maternal mortality, the same thing they were worried about in 1849. They didn't frame it that way. They're talking about miscarriages. This is the crude data that we have. It's not the best data. You can see the CDC data on the on the left there. I just put it in because it, at least it has a number for Native American women. And uh, you can see on the right uh, just the the uh, the pregnancy maternal mortality data. We're going up. The rest of the world is coming down. It breaks it down here a little bit by group. So this is another area where the United States does poorer much poorer than, than comparable rich countries. Um, so now all of a sudden, because some uh, famous people had some problems, uh, this is in the news now, it's popular, but we were thinking about this. It's, this is not new to women of color. This has been a problem forever. Uh, and the fact that, and we haven't gotten much further than 1849 and trying to figure out why. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, one of our great civil rights leaders, she was the victim of a Mississippi appendectomy, which basically means she was sterilized without her knowledge or consent, uh, which was common. Here are two important leaders, uh, physicians who are leaders in reproductive rights, not Roe v. Wade, uh, Dr. Redbird Urey. I actually have never had the privilege of meeting her, <laughs> and I don't know him. Hopefully she's still alive. I don't know. But she did studies in the early 70s that estimated that 40% of Native American women and 10% of men were sterilized uh, in the areas and the tribes that she looked at. Uh, women were sterilized because were immoral and they didn't want that many Native Americans around. Men are often sterilized to, quote, uh, uh, make them less dangerous. That's the reason men are usually sterilized. Helen Rodriguez Trias, I had the privilege of knowing and being a friend for her for years. We lost her uh, a decade or so ago. She is a, was a Puerto Rican pediatrician. Uh, Puerto Rico is one of the sites where uh, drug clinical trials were held on the birth control pill. Um, and, and these were done 
on the island of Puerto Rico. Um, it had the highest rate of sterilization in the world, the island of Puerto Rico at that time. Helen Rodriguez Trias is really the first Latina president of the American Public Health Association uh, and a real leader around reproductive reproductive rights, not simply the right for an abortion. So think about it. Think about the concept of the right to an abortion, which I support, because it really codifies and spreads a little tiny bit the privilege of being able to afford, et cetera, an abortion uh, to predominantly white women versus the concept of reproductive rights, which is a concept that women of color pushed which was we want the right to have children or not have children because the right to have children is often as difficult as the right to not have children. Okay. Um, so it's a more encompassing concept than simply uh, the right to abortion. Um, and uh, just to remind you of a recent case in 2020, uh, again, this is not a surprise. It should not be a surprise but this hit the press where they were finding uh, ICE detainees being taken to local ob for various miscellaneous problems and having uh, abortions. This is Dawn Wooten, who's a licensed practical nurse by training. She became a whistleblower again with some, I'm sure she doesn't have a PhD in history, but th again, this is not something that she would have been unaware of. She would know what a Mississippi appendectomy is. And so she came out and blew the whistle on this process of taking these young women uh, <clears throat> who didn't speak the language and couldn't read the language and without their knowledge, sterilizing them. And again, I want to spend, I don't, I don't have time to go over all these books, but I want to spend just a few times. There are so many wonderful books that you can really get a better feel for what goes on in American medicine. This particular one by, uh, Deidre Owens talks about the history of uh, uh, American gynecology, always a great book. This is a, a collected books, Precarious Prescriptions, is a book of collected uh, chapters. It's, it's not just one narrative book. And it just looks at race and health in North America. Uh, it talks about midwives and other things. So again, I encourage you to look at that. Here's a, a book in English uh, that looks at uh, public health in Latin America. Um, and uh, here's one book that's, again, that's specific. We don't have that many books. This is specific to Native Americans in North America. Um, so uh, Body and Soul, I think, is a book that's more accessible for everybody. This looks at the role of the Black Panther Party uh, in, in uh, healthcare. And let me just say, for those of you that are doing community health, this is a great book to read because the whole community health movement the Panthers were a part of that movement and in many ways exemplified it. And so it gives you a better understanding of where the community health movement came from, what role the Black Panthers had. In. And finally, Harriet Washington's great book on medical apartheid, where she goes back in the past and looks at a lot of the historical problems. Um, so again, these none of these things should catch you by surprise, even if you haven't heard of them. Uh, so then the right to abortion is not the same as reproductive uh, justice. And until we make sure that we're talking about reproductive justice, we will not be doing ourselves a service by suddenly restoring, quote unquote, the right uh, to get an abortion. What difference does it make if you have a legal right to get an abortion, but you don't have the financial wherewithal <laughs> to make it to the doctor or to have time off without getting fired so you can recover? So what have we talked about? So far, we've talked a little bit about some basic underlying issues. We've said you really have to have a clear notion of what, why you think people are healthy or not. Uh, how do people become healthy and stay healthy? How do populations become healthy and stay healthy? What's the difference between an individual health and a population health? Are they the same? You know, we, we talk so glibly in medicine and public health about risk factors. But are the risk factors for individual health the same as the risk factors for population health or not? My risk factor for high blood pressure, I wasn't always this fat, but 
So when I was younger, I wasn't fat. So are they the result of my diet or are they a result of the fact that I'm a black woman in America? You know, these are things that make a difference. You have to ask yourself, and how do we study that? How do we examine that? It's fine to have theories about it, but how do we examine it? So again, I look to my <clears throat> indigenous brothers and sisters, the first nations of, of, of this hemisphere. Uh, they are always on, on time. Um, this is, uh, maybe her name will come up. I'm blocking her name. Hold on. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Abigail Echo Hawk. Um, this is out of a group in Seattle or of urban uh, public health folks and Native Americans. If you don't collect the data, you no longer exist. So this is, let me just say right now, this is another basic structural racism issue. Gilbert G. Uh, talks about this in his work, even in the West Coast, even in the Northwestern part of the country, where Asians outnumber Blacks, you still will see reports that have data for Blacks and no data for Asians. So this notion, where does the notion come from? Oh, the population is too small to report. Okay, so here's a situation for Native Americans where, where it's very hard to get data. They don't really want data. Um, and she says the system of colonialism in the United States continues to increase the risk factors and outcomes for Native communities. And then we lump all the Native communities together. Well, that's a whole nother problem, but as we do for Asians and Latinos and so, so this data genocide uh, that this group has really called up as a focus creates a problem. How do you have a research framework if you don't pay attention to the data genocide? How do you, how do you organize and, and verify your groups? Um, and be clear that how we do it in the United States is just one arbitrary way. And it's changed over time. In the United States, we're famous for our one drop rule. Uh, but maybe we're losing the one drop rule. So how do we compare data from today compared with data from the 40s? Um, so as we think about community-based participatory research, this is the other things we have to think about. How do we count the data? What data are we collecting? What does it mean? What, what in fact is data? Um, and again, if we're not willing to have those discussions and think about them, we're really doing a disservice. So... Uh, <clears throat> Thinking about research and data justice, I think, is a useful concept to think about. Not just community participatory research. That just means you got some community people that you may or may not give some chump change to to comment on your research. But we're talking about research and data justice. That means you think about what does it mean to have a just research agenda? Okay, Not a research agenda that we determine in the academy or NIH or wherever it gets determined. And then we say, oh yeah, well, we had an advisory committee. Oh yeah, we hired some uh, peer educators. We hired, what does that mean? Data justice and data research is a little different than that. Are we willing to contemplate changing how we do that? And, and what counts as data? Are we willing to think about different methods and trying to validate different research methods? the framework that we're talking about. There's a whole movement and has been for the, at least a quarter of a century, at least, I would argue it goes back further than that, of decolonizing knowledge. So what does it mean to decolonize knowledge? It's hard for us to think about. I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm an allopathic European trained physician. They didn't teach, teach us nothing about this stuff. So I, I'm, I'm a colonially trained doctor, you know, like my parents would, <laughs> my parents, both of whom I had passed, but my parents would tell me, they would say, Linda, we don't trust doctors and we haven't forgotten that you're one. We love you. You're our daughter, but we haven't forgotten you're one of those doctors, you know, you know, anyway. So, and, and we shouldn't forget that either. We're trained in a certain style and method. And again, if we're not even aware of the arguments we need to be having, of the different ways of looking at how we're trained, then we're in real trouble and we're not able to contribute really to the work that needs to be done. And so this framework for looking for research and data justice argues that communities are experts in their own lives and that the historical and cultural knowledge that 
that communities have have to be brought to bear on whatever the research is. And communities are not monolithic. Just like you can have statisticians that have arguments about what tests to use. You certainly have physicians and nurses and clinical people that have arguments about how to make a diagnosis and what treatment to pick. You can clearly have researchers uh, and community-based researchers who have completely different theories about what's causing the problem. Um, and anyone who, who's not willing, to, who's uncomfortable with that is going to be in trouble. Because I'm going to tell you, you go to the churches and they'll tell you in a minute, if the young people were in the churches, they wouldn't be out here in the streets shooting people. Okay. But if, you know, if you're not a church person, then you might decide if the parents were doing what they were going to, you know, people have their built in frameworks and things that they think about. And so again, this is not a trivial thing, but the notion that we need to decolonize the data, that we have a right to be able to ask questions. That's what research is. When I was young, I didn't know. I thought research was just white people messing with us, which it is, but but it shouldn't be. The point is research ought to be the, the way we ask questions about what's going on. So the right to ask the questions, the right to collect the data, to, to, to have theories, uh, to and to argue about what we're seeing and how to change it. These are basic human rights. <clears throat> see where I am on my time. So <clears throat> I want to do a shout out to Hazel Johnson. Uh, you can see uh, she was with us until 2011. Hazel is a great woman. She she uh, is a community activist from Markel Gardens. I put this on here because some people care an early mentor to Barack Obama, but I don't want to blame her for anything that he did or didn't do. <laughs> but she was out there at Art Gale. She was she fought for years. Uh, she certainly taught me as a young physician uh, a lot about environmental health. Uh, she's really one of the mothers of the environmental justice movement in the United States. Um, and so because uh, I, I, I'm going to talk about the uh, toxic donut for a moment. <laughs> Hazel's the ones that coined this term, toxic donuts. Um, and those of you that don't know the south side of Chicago, this is the southeast side. Arkeo Garden is built on a landfill. It was built specifically for black veterans. Okay. So it's, it shouldn't be surprised it was built on a landfill. Um, and, and this is from a few years ago. 50 landfills, a couple of hundred industrial facilities, 250 leaking undergrounds. These are all low, low measures. Uh, and uh, so I don't know what to say about this. This is an isolated part of the of this city. And just to remind you, so of course it made sense if you have uh, here on the left, the general iron industries of the north branch of the river, uh, recycling metal and cars and stuff like that. They wanted to close that down where the rich people live and move it out here. Uh, to the south, uh, to the Calumet region out here on the south side, a black and Latino neighborhood. And again, this is something else, especially that new immigrants may not be aware of. One of the first solid Mexican-American communities in Chicago is here in the southeast side. The first Mexican-American Catholic church is here on the southeast side. So everything, Pilsen and Little Village is, is recent in the history of Mexican-Americans in the city of Chicago. So again, just to remind you, this was a situation that our school played an important role in. To relocate this recycling plant from the north branch of the river where rich white people live to, Cal to the Calumet region where Arcale Gardens, where black, poor black and uh, predominantly Mexican people live. And so um, there was, of course, as always, as there often is, community uh, uh, resistance. You can see here one of the one of the uh, demonstrations. And this map just gives you an idea of uh, where power plants are and other other big prop topics in uh, environmental justice in the Chicago area. Um, here's another great book. This is a fun book to read. David uh, Pello is one of our uh, leading writers and thinkers about environmental justice in the United States. Early in his career, he wrote this fantastic book Garbage Wars, A Struggle for Environmental Justice in Chicago. It's one of my favorite books this is from. This is from our community where the uh, where the university is. That's where this is, around Halstead. Oh, 
Did I lose five? Wait a minute. Maybe not. No, here it is. Um, so just in 1898, the mayor of Chicago, I don't even know who was the mayor then, I can't remember, appointed Jane Adams as Chicago's first woman garbage, garbage inspector. She asked, Jane Adams fought to get appointed. This is an alley near Halstead. Uh, as it existed back then, there was no garbage pickup. It didn't really exist in this community. At this point in time, this is an old uh, Italian, predominantly Italian neighborhood, but it was also an international neighborhood. Uh, it had Nicaraguans, Mexicans, Blacks, uh, but, the, but you can see the trash is just dumped out here with no collection. So it took Jane Adams a few years to get this cleaned up. Uh, but that's a great book. Check it out. And over 30 years ago, then in the United States, again, not a movement around environmental racism, a movement for environmental justice. So this was the first uh, people's uh, leadership summit around environmental justice led by people of color. Um, and here's the preamble. I won't read it to you, but it's a preamble that includes all of the groups it's a preamble that talks about 500 years of colonization and oppression, and it's a it was a family preamble. So you so you know you had people arguing and debating with each other, and I, I remember a number of, for example, black activists were saying like, well, why do we have to be worried about all this you know stuff in the forest and stuff in the Native Americans have been saying no, you don't you have to go back 500 years, you have to go back 600 years if you want to understand uh, colonialism. So. Um, that that becomes an important issue. So, so we have then in the United States a set of approaches around injustice, but we don't agree on what injustice is, uh, and we don't even agree on what epidemics are. So this is from Dawes, who talks about the political determinants of health. I'm not against thinking about it that way. You know, he tries to talk about the political determinants of health. Politics is very much involved. Um, and if you don't understand the politics that are involved, then you miss the structural racism. So this is just looking at the New Deal. When the New Deal gets put in and, and um, Social Security gets invented uh, for the United States, agricultural and domestic workers are excluded. Now, you can read that and ignore it if you don't understand history. But if you know anything about this country and you know when Social Security is put in, you know agriculture and domestic workers those are black workers in the time when this was put in place, okay? It's not an accident that agriculture and domestic workers are excluded uh, from benefits and unemployment insurance under the Social Security Act. It's not an accident when they did the National Recovery Act, which set the wages for certain things, that industries that were predominantly black had lower wages set, or that the Fair Labor Standards Act excluded agricultural workers, so when we think about U.S. history, here's another way to think about it. A struggle to be considered human before the Civil War. Certainly a struggle that everybody that wasn't a white person had in the United States. A struggle to secure freedom after the Civil War. The first Reconstruction, which I've already hinted to you, we lost. The struggle for human rights, human rights before World War II. Uh, again, the Civil Rights Movement is not the first time Black people in this country struggle for freedom. The modern civil rights movement from the 60s, uh, many people consider the second reconstruction. And today people argue we need a third reconstruction. So again, just some basic information that you have to wonder, why don't we know this stuff? How come, not, not we, how, how come this is not common knowledge? Mexican Americans are lynched in the United States during the same historical period that black people were lynched in the South for the same reasons, oppression and land. The rate of lynching was more or less very similar. Other people are lynched. This is a common method in the United States. Chinese were lynched, et cetera. But the reason why the lynching of Mexican Americans is not as well known, one of the reasons, is that the lynching of blacks wouldn't be known if it weren't for the NAACP and other people like Ida B. Wells. And what they would do, this is a basic epi tool. It's a basic epidemiological tool. They would scan the local newspapers, local newspapers, before Google now, and they would, in the local newspaper, in Mississippi or Alabama or wherever, they would say, 
Friday night, John was lynched, you know, and a good time was had by all. That's what would be in the local paper. But the vast majority of people for the NAACP could not read or write Spanish. So they did not scan the Spanish language papers. And so it's only relatively recently in the past 30, 40 years that we have some uh, scholars, Mexican-American scholars, <laughs> who went back and scanned the Spanish language papers of the Southwest and found those same things. Jose was lynched Friday night and a good time was had by all. So when they did the calculations, then they can document that the rate of lynching, how frequent it happened, and the proportion of people who were lynched is very similar to what happened with blacks in uh, in the Southern United not and it's not just the southern United States, I shouldn't in the United States in general. Now the biggest lynching, single lynching act actually turned out to be among Chinese. It were about 20 of them were lynched at once uh in LA. But that's a different story. So here's some other books again. This particular book, Forgotten Dead, this is the one that talks about the lynching of uh Mexican Americans, okay, in the United States. Uh this is I, this there are other more recent books. But Ronald Sakaki, he's still a great, I love the way he writes. He has a great overview of uh, Asian American history in the United States. So again, I recommend that to you. And this book here is an interesting book too. And again, it deals with the myths that we create. Um, if you think about it, this used to always bother me when I was a child. How could black people make it from deep in Mississippi to Canada? That always used to bother me. I understood how Harriet Tubman could make it because Harriet Tubman's hanging out around Baltimore and Maryland. So she, you know, she's less than a hundred miles from the, from the Mason Dixon line. Okay. But I didn't understand how people, and it turns out they didn't, of course, that people in Mississippi and Arkansas and Louisiana, they went South. They didn't go North to Canada. They went South to freedom, to Mexico and other places. <clears throat> so anyway, just some more books. Dr. Marie, um, yes. sorry to jump in. I just wanted to let you know in about 10 minutes, uh, we want to move to, to Q&A. Yeah, we'll, we'll be finished before then, yes. Perfect, thanks. So, so one of the things that we need to think about uh, when we think about our reaction to this um, is what do we do today about these epidemics of injustice? Um, France Fanon talks about what do the oppressed people do? And if you haven't had an opportunity to read France for no, you should. <laughs> and um, what's listed here in the right side is the silent march of, uh, of uh, 1917. They had a number of blacks killed um, in East St. Louis. This happens to be New York City. Okay. But in East St. Louis, which is still predominantly black, you had a, white people went in and killed a number of blacks in 1917. And so what happened is, again, we're being conservative here, eight to 15,000, 15,000 black people marched in New York City. They had the march segregated by gender. So this is the women's portion of the march wearing white. And they marched silently. Think about this. They marched silently in protest to this killing. 8,000 people, 15,000 people. And here, this, this is harder to see. This is the male part of the march. Again, all in suits in your Sunday best. Uh, again, marching in protest to this murder in East St. Louis of Black people. So again, I, I think the outpouring of support uh, when George Floyd is killed was tremendous. But if you're unaware, for example, of this silent march in New York City, uh, you may be not quite as impressed with that. And this allows me to just take a minute and look at all of the national federal legislation. So we have, starting in 1865 through 1870, the Civil Rights Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is what's being debated right now is in terms of whether or not Trump should be allowed to run again. These amendments were not passed easily. Uh, but they are the result of the pushing of the radical 
Republicans. That's when Lincoln, you know, the party of Lincoln. Now it's not the present day Republicans. But look at all these other civil rights acts. So we shouldn't act like the Civil Rights Act of 1965 is such a big accomplishment. It's one in 1886. These, I love these, these next two, Civil Rights Act of 1870 and Civil Rights Act of 1871. These are anti-KKK acts. That's what these were. We're going we're gonna to make an act to make the KKK illegal. Again, it failed. But you can see all of these acts coming all the way through the 60s up to the uh, voting rights amendments, etc. And uh, and we're going backwards in terms of these. Let's come back to public health for a minute as we round up. This is from Sandra Galeo, the dean of uh, the Boston uh, School of Public Health, where he's looking at different factors that can result in the numbers of deaths. And this again, this is very conservative. So we don't talk about low education, racial segregation. So he's He's just making an F estimate in 2000 that 245,000 deaths are caused by low education. Okay. Well, heart disease only caused 600 in 2018, uh, 660 deaths. So if you look at how we categorize our causes of death on the right compared to a different way we could categorize, why do we do it one way and not the other? Here's one of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. Frederick Engels' most famous book, Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844, another good book to read. But in any case, he argues in the conditions of the English working class for what he calls social murder. It may look like the person drank themselves to death, but he's arguing, Ingalls, who wasn't a physician, he calls it social murder. The ruling power of society, the class which at present holds social and political control, and bears therefore the responsibility of the conditions for those who don't they don't want to share control with. Here's Paul Farmer, who we unfortunately lost a few years ago, um, who talks about structural violence. Uh, and again, he's arguing human rights violations are not accidents. They are not random in distribution or effect. Rights violations are symptoms of deeper pathologies of power and linked intimately to social conditions that so often determine who will suffer abuse and who will be shielded from harm. And again, his books are great. Any book he wrote, you could will not waste time. Uh, you, you will not be wasting your time by reading it. It will be and here's Chris Hedges, a journalist. Um, and again, I like his definition. I think he writes very clearly. What is taking place is not neglect. It is not ineptitude. It is not a policy failure. It is murder. It is murder because it is premeditated. It is murder because a conscious choice was made by the global ruling class to extinguish life rather than protect it. It is murder because profit, despite the hard statistics, the growing climate disruptions and the scientific modeling is deemed more important than human life and human survival. Uh, that fits my definition of murder. So as we go on with your studies, remember, we have not always agreed on this and we still don't. So what are the causes? What kills people? Why do people die? For thousands of years, people thought the gods or their ancestors were angry. Uh, uh, angered. In 1839 in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain, malnutrition was not considered a cause of death. Think about that. Air pollution isn't caused <coughs> a cause of death until 2020. Is racism a cause of death? Police violence, voting suppression, oppression in general? How about war? That would seem to be easy. This is just a map of wars going on today. And so this is slides from last year. Is Ukraine the only active war? Seems like it. Um, so as American health professionals, we ignored for so many decades what was going on in Palestine, both in Gaza and the West Bank. 
Um, and so before this fall, we couldn't get a PHA to take a position saying that this wasn't good for human health and that the occupation of Palestine uh, caused death. Last year, because of uh, leadership uh, from around the country in which a number of students and faculty played a role, the governing council was able to pass a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. And this is what people should remember, especially if you're not part of these communities. Oppression is an unjust exercise of power. And it comes with all kinds of strings attached to it. Um, but just like uh, there's been so much surprise on the evening news with who is uh, supporting Palestine and who isn't, but this is just an old picture of Arafat and Nelson Mandela. Again, when I was a child, when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, this is what we thought about Palestine. Uh, it's not an accident that the Palestinians have a picture up of George Floyd so fast. These are communities, they may not have the best communication, but they've been in communication and alliance over decades. And so today, uh, actually today, proper, South Africa was at the International Court of Justice calling, uh, accusing Israel of violating the uh, 1948 Genocide Convention. Uh, and uh, they uh, presented eloquently at that court today. Um, and we'll see what the court decides. Um, but uh, in our city, especially all around the world, but in our city, where we have the highest concentration of Palestinians in the country, exists in the Chicagoland area. Uh, so in our city, this is an important, uh, critical issue, and uh, it impacts all of us in, in our campus, as our student group has sued the university uh, uh, before, before the war broke out. So think about what what are we talking about? What wars count? What wars, how come we don't think of all those other wars? Because we don't even care about the people that are being killed in those other wars. So what should public health workers need? We need a better understanding of history. And don't act like you have to get a PhD in history. Whenever you're doing something, read a little bit about the history. If you're doing a, a, a patient education project with diabetics, read a little bit of history about diabetes. Did you know that it wasn't that long ago that diabetes was considered a Jewish disease and you could only get it if you were Jewish? We didn't have the ability to understand and analyze structural determinants. This is something Americans are really in trouble with because we don't even teach about structural determinants. We don't teach about the economy. We don't teach about how the political structure of our country relates to what's going on today. We don't tell the difference between our particular weird system of government and say a parliamentary system of government? Do we know what the differences are? The ability to ask questions and question our assumptions, the ability to communicate with a wide array of disciplines, anthropology, psychiatry, history, social science, the ability to communicate with the general public. And what should we be doing as public health people? We can learn and teach the history of our field to understand how we got here. We can be clear that racism is not binary, it's not just black and white, but that anti-racism has and continues to play an important special role in the world of things. Be able to explicitly state the values you are following. Start where you are. You have to understand the systems and the structures that support it in order to know how to dismantle the system. Otherwise, the shit comes crashing down and you'll be dead underneath it. Understand how your issue, whether it's climate change, smoking cessation, how is it connected with all of these other issues? Don't be afraid to fight for a new world, a world at peace where social justice is the law of the land. So let me stop there and invite you to disagree. That's what I like best is when people disagree. Uh, or ask questions, or we can ask questions of each other. Um, and uh, I, I will, I know next week, not next week, but the next speaker, I think, is David still the next speaker? Somebody, Dr. Stovall, is he going to be? Don't miss Dr. Stovall. I think, I think he's scheduled this he, year. I can't. He's week three. There you go. Two weeks from today. All right. He's going to, he's going to be focusing on uh, racial capitalism. 
So again, I'm open for questions. I would prefer that you unmute yourself and speak. <laughs> hey, Dr. Murray, I got a question. Um, and by the way, I don't know if you remember me, but like back in the 80s, I was uh, at the Sun-Times as a health reporter and I covered you 100 years ago. Ah, but, that means that means I'm 100 years old, Howard. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, that means I'm 150 years old. But, but, but let, let me ask you, uh, <clears throat> you talk about history. What, what do you know about the history of Trumbull Park? Not, not a lot. I mean, I, you know, that was down in South Deering, and I, I grew up there. And, uh, you know, it, my parents moved down there, white family. I never knew why my parents moved there, because 1953, there, there, there were race riots there. Hmm. Because a black man who was a veteran, and he was a writer for uh, Downbeat Jazz Magazine, he, uh, <clears throat> he moved in. And uh, we get you know into the public housing. We had family that were living in the public housing there, and uh, you know it was just it was it took ten years for th things to kind of straighten up down there where black people didn't need a police escort to use the park. So I just throw that out to you. Uh, well, that that's important. You know, I'm I'm not really uh, from Chicago, Howard, so I didn't come here until 1966, but. What he's mentioning is important. Don't be afraid. To, they may seem like unimportant to you. Don't be afraid to tell your family members, especially younger ones, what you observe, because that that is the nature of history. It's not what they tested us on in high school. So th thank you for that information. By the way, uh, that, that episode was important to Mayor Daly. He was chairman of the uh, Cook County Democratic uh committee and he was able to get like the defender the black newspaper to endorse him and then he got the white homeowners association which was a super racist group to endorse him so daily played both sides off so it was actually a much more significant episode in chicago mm -hmm. at any rate uh, that's your history lesson for today dr murray well thank you Other I questions know, or is, comments? Yeah. Also, is Emily um, from the uh, yeah instruction on. team. Um, if we could take like a two minute bio break just to give uh, Sylvia, the interpreter, a chance to catch her breath and grab some water, um, that would be great. So we're gonna pause for two minutes, if that's all right. Everyone, collect your thoughts, gather your questions. Thank you.
All right. I'm not sure if uh, our, our translator is back, but <clears throat> if there are more questions, uh, people can unmute and Hi, Dr. Murray. Um, my name is Melanie. I actually had the pleasure of, or in the privilege of sitting in, in one of your, uh, in your presentation at APHA. And something that kind of resonated with me, and you kind of talked about it a little bit, was um, here, or you touched on it a lot, is um, like structural violence in plain sight. And something that resonated with me was your example um, when you talked about your, um, I think it was your nephew, your five-year-old nephew, um, and he was hiding the fact that he was reading. And so I just I wanted to bring that up because, I, like I said, it resonated with me. And I think I think about like how I um, engage with, you know, I work at, at a hospital, how I engage with patients or in my team or how my team engages with, you know, people on a daily basis. So I just wanted to share that maybe I don't know if you want if it's applicable here. I, I just thought it was such a great example. Oh, uh, well, thank you. It's it's always applicable. I, I'll... It, you know, the problem is you, when you tell a story, you get into a rhythm. But let me just try to truncate it as much as I can. Uh, my nephew is is an African-American young man. He's Well, he's a grown man now. But when he was very young, he was uh, <clears throat> at an Ancona school. And his teacher was all happy because she thought he was getting ready to learn how to read. When, in fact, he was already reading at the second or third grade level. And when I queried why his teacher didn't know he could read, he clearly had deliberately tried to hide that fact from her uh, in order to please her. He, he, he clearly figured out what she wanted him to do, which was not read. And so he delivered what, what he knew he wanted to, her to, him to do. And in fact, <laughs> there's lots of eloquent research work that shows this is true. Students live up to, especially at that age, they live up to or down to what the, what the faculty what the teacher expects from them. Um, and so if you if you expect you're dealing with a dumb kid, that's what they present to you. You all are so quiet. You know, Dr. Murray, how you doing? My name is Lynn Rowe Felton. I was noticing as you was you were giving your uh, your presentation, I was thinking about um 1923, I think it was Margaret Singer, Planned Parenthood and mm -hmm. how they were sterilizing women of color without their without their knowledge. Uh, do you have any any books that we can get further information or any suggestions regarding that? On, on that on that specific thing, not off the top of my head. Okay. Um, but um, but and, and again, you know, I, but I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I for example, the ability. For women to have the ability to control our reproductive system, I think is an important advance. But you can always have, if you have people that who think poorly of Black women, then even if they're bringing in something that might be helpful, it'll turn out bad. These are always nuanced differences in arguments. So, and for example, not everybody that were that supported the abolition of American slavery thought Blacks were equal. You know, many of them thought we were we were inferior. So it's not enough just to say this is the sort of like uh, what they call it, uh, the, the litmus test. No, you could be against slavery, but still think blacks were inferior to whites uh, and not support uh, voting rights, etc. So somebody suggesting killing the black body by Dorothy Roberts. I can't. That is a good book uh, uh, that someone I can't remember. Oh, it, here it is. There's a chapter on Sanger in that book. So I can tell you that book is a great book, Killing the Black Body by Dorothy Roberts. who She's a lawyer by training. All of her books are good, but that's a good book. And I forgot there was a chapter in there on Sanger. So um, so check that book out. That answers your question. Thanks for, for whoever answered. Sweet Pea, thank you for giving us that good suggestion. Hi, Dr. Murray. Um, I'd just like to start off by thanking you for the, the wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Jordan, and I'm currently an MPH student here at UIC. Um, and my question, um, and bear with me, because I'm still trying to formulate the exact words that I would like, but um, I feel that as a young person, um, 
I feel that in many ways, critical, relevant, and important information such as that was, you know, found in this wonderful presentation is increasingly hard to find and encounter in popular circles, both in person and online. Um, and I have my own thoughts on, on that as well. But what is your take on like the responsibility of academics and professionals that one are have access to spaces like these? Um, what responsibility do we have in terms of making information like this accessible, relevant um, to the general public? Because um, I don't know, just generally speaking, I feel like I go on the internet and I just see some of the most ridiculous stuff um, and with the rise of like misinformation and so forth. Um, I feel like there's a moral pitfall in academia um, where we just kind of close our our knowledge and our insight behind closed doors or um, and so forth. But I, I just like to hear your take on on that issue. Okay, well, let me let me answer that uh, a couple of ways. So let me, I'll tell another, somebody like my family. I mean, this is another family story about my my baby uh, granddaughter who's now twenty two. But so when she was when she was a baby, when she was you know five or whatever how old she was, like all grandmothers, I asked her, you know, what did you learn in school today? And normally she would say nothing, like any normal kid. And one day I asked that question, and she said to me, "Did you know?" that eggs are really dead baby chickens. And so I laughed and said, yeah, I knew that. And then she looked at me, she came close and she said, did you know that we used to be slaves? And I looked at her and I said, yes, I knew that. And then she pointed her finger at me and she said, you're supposed to tell us the important stuff. Um, that's my answer to you, Jordan, but I mean it in this way. You know, I'm 75, so when you say this information is hard to get to a 75-year-old, that's just not true. I mean, I used to say when I was, I don't know exactly how old you, when I was in college, I used to say, yeah, it's hidden in the libraries. But that doesn't mean everybody has access to the library or has time to go to the library, but the information was buried in the libraries. Today, I I, I feel, but this is a, this is a, a broader historical, I feel like, oh, this is so easy to find, relatively speaking, because all you need is Google and an internet connection. Um, however, that's not really what we want. I mean, your question is really more important than just the information. So we are being taught and we, and we perpetuate a way of thinking about the world, a way of doing science that adheres to a specific set of values and a specific theoretical framework on how things work or how we want things to work. That's why it appears to be hidden. Um, even though objectively, and I think you, I think you would even agree with this. If I give you a hint, like it takes you, it would take you 30 seconds to look up that guy. I forgot his name, Anton, that I told you I hadn't heard of until recently while I was reading this book, but you could Google him now and you could, you could read about him right away. You wouldn't have to find some specific special library that might have uh, information about him. And you could even read what he's written in English because it's been translated. So I think that um, it's not that the academic community has knowledge that they're keeping secret. In fact, I would argue they don't even understand all the information that they have. And that what, if, in how you look at the information, uh, we just heard from uh, Howard about Trumbull Park. How you look at certain information changes very much depending on what perspective you're looking at it from. So um, I do think that there's certain things that we could do better. Uh, and I invite you to do it um, with every assignment that you have. Uh, excuse me for a minute, I'm a clinician. You know, if, you, if you're doing a, a, if you're meeting and working with a patient, you need to understand their history. How long have they had pain or what, you know, you need to understand what's going on with them. Um, and so it's the same thing. If you're working on a specific problem, trying to decrease teenage smokers, you need to understand, well, how did, how did we get smoking in the first place? When did the tobacco industry uh, get big? What does it do? What does it control? So when you start asking the right questions, then that information becomes to like simply having in your mind a bunch of facts is not good enough. How are these facts connected? Okay, how are these issues 
connected and how do they interact with each other? That takes more than just simply knowing the facts. That means having some idea about methodology and having some theories and being wrong and being able to learn stuff. Um, so, uh, and, and when you do that, you'll be able to make those connections in your normal everyday work. Um, because that's, that's really, that's really how history is made, you know, to be able to say to somebody, oh, when I was young, Trumbull Park did this, or, you know, that's an important interchange that we don't do enough of. And we don't value that much as Americans, unfortunately. As I said before, we're an ahistorical people, uh, but we don't have to be, and we don't have to stay that way. Uh, so, so I do think that we have an obligation in the academy to teach appropriately. So I am very critical, for example, of the school, the public health, the medical school, all these schools. It's, it's unconscionable that they actually turn out health professionals without understanding any history of the profession. Uh, I, I just find it amazing uh, that, that we allow that to happen. And students have always done exactly what this course is called. We, what do we call it? We, in, our, in, in medical school, we used to call this the realities of medicine. You know, um, So students have always said we're not learning what we need to learn. And they've always organized themselves to make sure they can learn what they feel they need to learn. You all are graduate students in the main here. There's no reason you have skills and tools that didn't exist 50 years ago, there's absolutely no reason why you can't do what you've done with this course, for example, and structure your own education uh, and fight for it to be uh, become the standard. Thank you for that answer um, and the whole presentation, Dr. Murray. I do want to be conscious of everyone's time since it is 7.30. Um, we do have to uh, close out for the day, um, but we hope to see most, if not all of you next week um, for an action lab. Uh, that will be, the action labs will be more interactive um, and may include breakout groups, more discussion, more question answer. Um, so we're excited to see you all there. There will be a new Zoom link coming, um, but once that one sent out and you're registered, that will be the same link for the rest of the semester. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who, who came, all the students, and thank you again, Dr. Murray. It was great to hear you talk. Thank you. And, and I just want to mention to the students in the course, we'll be reviewing the syllabus next week. So don't worry, everything will be online um, or we'll be talking about it next week. Thank you.